Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here. And I'm also going to give something that's a little different, perhaps, from what you've been hearing for much of the last uh, three days in terms of some concrete experiences and examples from the power industry and learning how to deal with wind, <clears throat> primarily wind forecasting and the planning and operations of power systems. A number of people have asked me, uh, spacebar. Ah, very good. Thank you. They've asked me about the name of UVIG, so I have to say the uh, oh, that too, yeah. okay. about the name UVIG, the Utility Variable Generation Integration Group. Well, we used to be <clears throat> the Utility Wind Integration Group, but then a couple years ago, our members decided we should add solar to our uh, our bag of tricks. So we spent a long time trying to figure out exactly how we should change our name. And one of the popular suggestions was the Utility Solar and Wind Integration Group. But then you think about that, and that's U SWIG. And we figured, well, U SWIG doesn't have quite the right connotation to it. So we went with something a little more conservative with the Utility Variable Generation Integration Group. So that's how we went from U WIG to U VIG. Uh, UVIG is now an association, about 180 members, about half of them are utilities, the other half come from a broad cross-section of the industry, deal with uh, wind forecasters, power systems engineering consultants, project developers, manufacturers of wind turbines, manufacturers of solar power plants. So a very good, diverse group. We have a very good conversation. We organize around user groups that deal with particular aspects of the integration and interconnection problem. We're primarily a technical organization. The mission really is to identify and resolve issues associated with putting a lot of variable generation on the system. So that's what the association does. I want to give a little bit of uh, overview of the wind, primarily wind integration problem. I focus more on wind than on solar due to the limited time. Some findings from recent studies that have been done to give you a little bit of insight about the kinds of uh, things that utilities worry about with a lot of variable generation on the system. Then a, a little bit uh, more information about the wind forecasting and how it's impacted utility planning and operations. And then the interaction between wind forecasting and market design and operation. That's a really critical uh, link in uh, the use of forecasts and also in the modification of existing system operating practices and rules to make best advantage of forecasts. And the results from a recent UVIG workshop. We hold a workshop every, every year, the uh, forecasting workshop, variable generation forecasting for, uh, for power systems. We get a good broad cross-section of the membership that participates in that. We've been doing it for about five years now. It's been a very effective uh, forum for dialogue between the different members of the, of the industry. And I think we've gained a lot of understanding and uh, made a lot of progress because of that. And then I'll conclude with some uh, conclusions and recommendations. So, so what's the big deal about renewable energy? Why are, why are people, particularly in the power industry, concerned about uh, renewable <coughs> energy and integrating into the system? Well, it really has to do with the two characteristics that we call variability and uncertainty. But it's not like the existing power system doesn't have variability and uncertainty. It certainly does. The loads are variable and uncertain, and the generation, to some extent, is also uh, certainly uncertain, if not variable. But if you look at the load, for example, that variability and uncertainty is much better understood by the power system operators. The load comes up in the morning, it goes down at night, repeats it day after day, and you could probably look a year from now and have a pretty good idea of what the variability in the load is going to be. The uncertainty is also... Um, bounded much more so than the uncertainty associated with the variable generation. The uncertainty might be a, a percent or two a day ahead, assuming that you know what the temperature is pretty well, rather than five or 10 percent a day ahead. So there's predictable patterns that the utility operators get used to dealing with. And the, the variability and uncertainty associated with the renewable energy, it's not different in kind, on, only different in degree, but it has patterns that are not quite so predictable as the ones they've become used to dealing with. So it, it uh, creates change, and change is always difficult for people. So th the question is really more one of how does it affect the amount of variability and uncertainty 
how does that affect the operation of the power system? What are the costs associated with it? And what does the future look like as we get more variable generation on the system? Well, if you break out variability and uncertainty as being the two key characteristics of renewable energy, then the two critical tools for dealing with that are flexibility and forecasting. Flexibility for dealing with the variability, forecasting for dealing with the uncertainty. I'm going to say a little bit about flexibility and then focus more on the, on the forecasting. But flexibility really is the ability to manage the power system to respond to the needs for greater variability in the output of the, of the power plants or the other resources available to the system. And there are many different sources of flexibility available to the system. Markets are one of, and what I have shown here is sort of a notional flexibility supply curve. So <clears throat> as you move up the, uh, the curve, the sources of flexibility become more expensive. It, it's not a, a true uh, supply curve, but just a notional one. And the, uh, the message here is that some, there are some very cheap sources of flexibility available to the system in markets, whether they be energy markets, capacity markets, uh, ancillary service markets, price responsive load markets, or also just demand, demand response. Flexible generation, simple cycle gas turbines, combined cycle gas turbines, and even in some places coal plants. I was visiting Ontario Power Generation a week or so ago, and uh, really the reason was that Ontario is planning to shut down all of its coal fire generation by the end of the year, this year or next year. And they were really bemoaning the fact that they were losing all of the flexibility that their system had when they shut their coal plants down. Now, you don't hear many people saying that because most people think of coal as being relatively inflexible. But Ontario Power Generation has figured out how to manage the coal plants in such a way that they got a lot of flexibility from them. Traditional storage, hydro pump storage, and to some extent compressed air storage. Although we're running out of good uh, environmentally acceptable storage sites and the costs are going up. Uh, wind curtailment. A lot of people don't like to talk about curtailment as a source of flexibility. But when you look at the, the options available, if you've got a lot of wind and uh, you need to move it someplace else, you've got to build transmission. And you look at the cost of curtailing a bit of wind versus the cost, that's a very lumpy cost of uh, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars of building new transmission. Oftentimes, the economic solution is to curtail some wind instead of making the next investment in transmission. And then some new forms of storage. But as I said, there's a lot of other forms of uh, flexibility that are available. Storage, particularly the new forms like batteries, flywheels, um, superconducting magnetic energy storage are pretty expensive. But if you look to the demand side again, like uh, plug hybrid electric vehicles, if you can get somebody else to buy the storage for you and then you can operate it as part of the system, there could be a much better uh, ability to incorporate that, that storage into the system to help manage variability. I'm going to talk about some time scales of interest in the, uh, the next few minutes. What I've got here is just a notional uh, daily load shape, starting uh, with a load low at night, reaching a peak during the middle of the day and coming back down at night. And I define three different uh, time scales of interest here. One is the regulation time scale, and that's from seconds to minutes. It's the very uh, short time um, range of motion of the power plants to try to maintain the frequency of the system or balance the tie lines. Then the load following time period, which is typically tens of minutes to a few hours, dealing with ramping events or the changes in output of the plants from you know, one period to another as the load changes. And then the scheduling or unit commitment time frame, that goes from a few hours to a few days ahead and deals with the startup <coughs> the startup of uh, large units that have a certain lead time, long thermal time constants that need to be considered in the scheduling of the generation. So just to give you some feel for the, uh, the impact of a lot of renewables on the system, what I've got here is some dispatch stacks which show the, the loading of generation for as the result of a study that was done in WEC, the Western Electricity Coordinating Council, looking at a specific footprint within WEC I'll, I'll show a map of WEC in just a moment. But it <clears throat> looks at the impact of 10%, 20%, and 30% wind with 3 to 5% of solar as part of that, but the focus was on wind. Going out into the 2020 time period in the, uh, in the Western Electricity Coordinating Council. And if you look at this, uh, this stack bar chart here, 
you can see, for example, the nuclear plants on the bottom, then the coal plants here, then going up to the wind plants, and then uh, you can see some solar thermal with six hours of storage, some solar PV, some gas turbines, and this uh, purple here is the combined cycle, and then hydro up on the top. And what you see is you go from a 10% to a 20% to a 30% scenario, and this is a case where gas is more expensive than coal, so coal is dispatched first, is that the wind starts to push some of the uh, combined cycle out of the, out of the mix, pushes in the 20% scenario, more combined cycle out of the mix and then starts to dip down into the coal. And by the time you get to the 30%, and this is annual energy, by the way, 30% of the annual energy produced for load coming from renewables, you can see that the combined cycle is just about pushed completely out, taking some big bites out of the, uh, the coal stack, and then starting to dip down into the nuclear. Probably wouldn't happen. The, the nuclear would probably be considered as a must run, and you wouldn't actually see any reductions in it. And uh, then you see some area like in the 30% case where this red here shows up, it's the gas turbines. Actually what happened there is in the simulation there was both a, a forecast and a forecast error, and this was a place where the forecast error was large and gas turbines were needed to uh, come on to meet the reliability needs of the system. So just to give you some, some uh, idea of what the impact of a lot of renewables is on the system and why utility operators get concerned. And on the same system, that was a day in April, by the way, it was the worst week in a three-year set of simulations, a three-year set of hourly simulations. Uh, the uh, kind of a benign week is a week in July. The wind and the solar weren't particularly high during that week, and you can see even in the 30% case, the, uh, the impact primarily is to push some of the combined cycle out of the, uh, out of the stack. So there's been a lot of studies done of wind integration impacts on systems, wind integration costs, on the left-hand side here, what I have is a little chart from a recent report of the International Energy Agency, Task 25, under the Wind, and wind Annex, which is an uh, impact of large amounts of renewables on power systems. And it shows the integration cost as a function of the uh, penetration level. And the message there is that as the penetration levels go up, the integration costs go up. In this case, the uh, sum of a lot of studies from around the world shows costs between maybe one in six euros, one to six euros per megawatt hour. And it's interesting, as you dig into these studies, they all have different assumptions, you know, different models, but basically the, they're the difference in the system operating cost between the case with the renewables and the case without the renewables. You see that a, a big cause for the difference in the integration cost is the forecast and how far ahead the forecast was used in those highest uh, cost scenarios they're looking at balancing the system using a day ahead forecast, whereas in the lower, uh, lowest cost, they're looking at balancing the system using hour ahead forecast. So it just goes, I think, to emphasize the fact that the way you use the forecast in the system operation is very critical. And in the lower right hand side, there's an interesting uh, separation of integration costs for entities in the U.S. that are in large balancing areas or large market areas and those that are in non-market areas or very small balancing areas. And the ones in the bottom are the ISO markets, independent system operator markets, one to five dollar megawatt hour kinds of costs. And the ones in the top in yellow are in the five to fifteen dollar megawatt hour cost. So again, the system design, system operating policies play a big role. So why wind power forecasting is important? I think we've spoken about uh, at least two of these reasons during the past couple of days. Economics, better forecasts mean lower operating reserves. Lower operating reserves mean lower costs. Reliability, system operator wants to know what's going on, what's happening, what's coming at him. He doesn't want to be caught unaware and have a uh, serious reliability event on his hands. And then market operation, in order to improve the design of the system, you need to have a good forecast and you need to know how to use it in your, uh, in your market operation. I mentioned the ISOs and RTOs in North America. I show this map for a couple of reasons. WEC that I talked about is the area uh, in the western half of the U.S., this white area here that's got the California ISO and the uh, Alberta Electric System Operator in it. The rest of WEC is a non-market area, so they don't have organized electricity markets. They don't like to say that they have disorganized markets either. They just have bilateral markets. <laughs> In the rest of the U.S. and Canada, um, there are organized electricity markets that are subject to FERC jurisdiction. They're 
kind of locally designed and implemented, but have to follow some general guidelines of the FERC. And I'll talk about uh, events in a couple of them. MISO, this uh, Midwest Independent System Operator, is a very large market in the middle part of the country. It's about a 100 gigawatt peak load, I think about 140 gigawatts of capacity. Another is the New York ISO, which is this, uh, this region right over here in pink. They're a smaller market. They're about a 35 gigawatt uh, capacity, around a 30 gigawatt peak load. And the PJM, which I think is the largest organized market in the world, is about 160 gigawatts of a peak load. So <clears throat> the interesting thing about these ISOs is that five or six years ago, there was only one ISO in North America that was using a wind forecast. That was the California ISO. Nobody else was using one. Five years later, every ISO in North America is using a wind forecast. I think it just speaks to the, uh, how, how quickly things have progressed and how quickly the learning has taken place and the value that they've provided. You've probably seen these kinds of charts before. This one is from a uh, forecast provider. It's a three-day forecast prepared about a day in advance. It's an ensemble. I think it had something like 80 members in it for a region in um, northern Germany or Denmark. And it, it shows the kind of uh, forecast information that was available at the time. It shows the maximum, the minimum, there's a median, uh, an average in there, and then the actual uh, happening was the black dotted line. But several interesting things are that the closer you are to the time the forecast is done, typically the smaller the band is, the better the, the forecast is. As you get out in time, you can get some pretty large, uh, large variance in the forecast. So, it's, it's nice to keep doing the forecast in a, uh, an updated fashion, so you always are operating in a, a tighter uh, probability band there. And you can imagine that if you have that kind of uncertainty, if you had that kind of uncertainty hour or a few hours ahead, you'd have to carry a lot more reserves to try to manage the system to account for that uh, unknown uh, wind plant output in the near future. There's different forecasts for different time periods. Just a situational awareness forecast that uh, used for severe weather events and properly positioning the system to take uh, the proper steps, the proper precautions necessary to protect the, uh, the system, maintain reliability. Hour ahead forecast, uh, some kind of a rapid update cycle, maybe five or 10 minute forecasts, four to six hours ahead. Some people refer to these as ramp forecasts. Other people just refer to them as, as rapid updates, but really managing the variations, the variability in the near term more focused on reliability. The day ahead forecast, more focused on economics, look at the, uh, the output a couple of days ahead, important for the unit commitment. You've got to know which plants to have available and make sure you've got your most economic units available when you need them and aren't uh, either buying expensive energy or starting up expensive units. Nodal injection forecasts, <clears throat> you've got to know where the energy is coming into the system, in the transmission system, so that you can manage congestion you may have to redispatch your system to manage the congestion, so that's an important one. And there's different uh, performance metrics that are appropriate for all of these forecasts. This is a slide I put together after one of our wind forecasting workshops about a year or two ago. I haven't updated it in the last year. But there's two interesting trends, I think, that are, that are uh, interesting to look at here. And it's looking at the forecast error, both on an energy and a capacity basis, because some people use one, some people use the other. Going from a single plant to a large region, you can see that the forecast error decreases significantly. And then going from day ahead to hour ahead, you can see that the forecast accuracy decreases significantly. I think you all know that. I think a lot of people in the power system world didn't really appreciate that, but as they understood it, it certainly affected the way they used the forecasts. And then the forecast error decreasing with region size. This was a, a uh, slide that was presented by, by Ulrich Falken from Energy and Mateo showing the uh, decrease in the forecast error going from a, a single plant to an area about 1,000 kilometers the size of Germany with the, uh, the error reduced to 42% 40 of the uh, single forecast, forecasting over a large region. A few uh, words on the value of forecasts. This is a result from this uh, Western Wind and Solar Integration Study that I showed you the dispatch stack from early, a little bit earlier. It looks at uh, two different uh, penetrations level, or uh, two different penetrations le levels between 10% and 30%. 
at what the value of a 10 percent improvement in the forecast and a 20 percent improvement in the forecast would be. And you can see that the numbers are between 100 and 200 million dollars, which is a, a significant a sum of money and it's worth going after. A little different look in that same footprint. I think we heard uh, maybe this number from our friends at NOAA or NCAR. This is the uh, result of implementing that that forecasting system that was spoken about earlier in the Excel service territory. Excel is a holding company that owns three operating companies in the U.S., Northern States Power, Southwestern Public Service, and uh, Public, uh, Northern, yeah, Public Service Colorado, Northern States Power, and Southwestern Public Service. And if you look at the forecast MAE from 09 to 12, you can see that there was a, uh, about a 30 percent reduction and savings of $21 million for a system that, that probably cost them a couple million dollars, so a nice return on the investment there. NERC is the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. It's responsible for ensuring the reliability of the system in North America. It operates under the uh, guidance of FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. They uh, had a task force called the Integrating Variable Generation Task Force that they made a report in 2000 and Nine, it was followed up by some detailed reports in 2010 and 2011. This is one on forecasting. I think their observations are, are pretty interesting and pretty important. There's five of them. Uh, the first one, that wind and solar plants need real-time met data and electrical data. I think we've touched on that the last couple of days. Uh, using multiple wind plant output forecasts, not just a single forecast, the ensembles and the multi-models. And then how the forecasts are used initially, you know, utilities have to kind of get used to them, so just using them for reliability purposes initially, but then getting them into the unit commitment so that the dispatch of the system is done in a more economical fashion. And then probabilistic methods, which have been talked about in the last few days also. Utilities are used to working in a deterministic world, not a probabilistic world, but as they get more and more variable generation, really stochastic resources on the system, they need uh, need to become familiar with probabilistic methods, and that's an ongoing, uh, an ongoing task. Say, uh, I think the forecasting industry has actually kind of gotten ahead of the utilities in that regard. They're able to provide the information. It's not being used to its uh, full extent yet. That's an area for work to be done. The fourth recommendation is, uh, has to do with operating practices and market rules, sub-hourly markets. So you don't change your dispatch on the hour, you change your dispatch within the hour. That's a, uh, a different way of operating for some folks. Uh, incorporating the forecast into unit commitment. You know, there was a while when utilities would get day ahead, they'd get a fax sheet of paper with 24 numbers on it saying this was the wind plant output forecast for the next day. They'd kind of look at it and say, oh, that's interesting, but what am I going to do with it? So until you really take that forecast and put it into your planning and operating tools, it, it doesn't really do uh, near as much good as it could. Negative prices in the U.S., our approach to markets, we uh, have negative price offers when you don't want to run or when uh, encourage generators to get off the system when there's an excess of generation. And then larger balancing areas and fewer transmission constraints are very important for getting the benefits of aggregation over broad geographical regions. And then the last recommendation really about cooperation between industry and government and uh, also mentions another set of players we haven't talked about here, and that is the providers of energy management systems to the utilities. It's important because there's only a few vendors, like ABB, Siemens, uh, Alstom, that provide these systems to utilities. It's important to get these uh, forecasting capabilities into those tools so they can be used more readily by the utilities themselves. I mentioned policy, the importance of policy both in market design and operation or just system design and operation. I want to talk a little bit about the MISO Intermittent Dispatchable Resource, the DIR policy that really puts wind on dispatch so that wind is operated under the economic dispatch program of the utility. A lot of people, including the, uh, the wind project owners, thought that was a terrible idea, that they were going to be curtailed all the time, but they found out something a little bit different and then adjusting the market rules to better accommodate the capabilities of the forecast. So it's important to understand that the electricity markets that we have today, I think both in the U.S. and in Europe, they were designed 15 years ago or more, and they were really not designed with the needs of variable generation in mind. Nobody was really thinking about large amounts of variable generation and how it would affect the market. And it has dramatic effects on the market. And uh, 
I'm not going to talk about energy and capacity markets, but a little bit about ancillary service markets because the, uh, the reserves, different types of reserves that are needed for power system operation with a lot of wind uh, fall under the ancillary service category. So regulation is the most expensive ancillary service. That's the one I showed in the beginning that takes care of the uh, short time balancing from a few seconds to a few minutes. What I have here are some prices from two markets that the Brendan Curvy prepares every year, the California market and the ERCOT market. The uh, products in the market are different from one RTO to, to another, but if just look at the California one, reg up and down, you can see prices from like 10 to $30 a megawatt hour over the uh, period of time, 02 to 12, and then spin, non-spin, and replacement reserves, and the average cost of the different categories of reserves uh, goes down as you go down the stack and they, the uh, response time gets longer. But the message here is that very fast reserves are very expensive very slow reserves can be very cheap. Also, markets themselves, I mentioned, have a lot of flexibility in them. Here's some more data from Brendan. Looking at a number of different markets across a few years, looking at the day ahead, hour ahead, <coughs> and five minute price. <coughs> and what you can see is that over the year, the average day ahead, hour ahead, and five minute prices are pretty similar. They don't change very much. What does change a lot is the average within our five minute range. So you can send a big price signal at the five minute uh, period and you can get the market to move without really paying anything extra for it. So if you have a well designed market with a, a good stack of generators and you know what kind of variability to expect, you've got the right units committed, you can do a lot to balance the system within the hour without doing anything heroic. I want to talk a little bit about uh, wind on dispatch in ERCOT. ERCOT is another area another RTO that has done a lot with uh, wind forecasting. ERCOT puts wind on dispatch and it uh, considers the variability in the two categories, or the, <coughs> the uh, variability and the uncertainty. They handle the variability, or, or they handle the uncertainty within the, um, within the five minute period they handle the variability within the five minute period with regulating capacity. So the only regulation they do is within the five minute period and every five minutes they use the persistence forecast at that period for the next five minutes. So they use a very bit, little bit of regulation to balance the system. And they looked at the cost of that going from no wind to the amount of wind that they have, got the numbers associated with that. And then they looked at the Uncertainty, and the uncertainty here it shows the actual wind in red and the uh, forecast day ahead in blue. But with their forecast, with the rapid update forecast, the uncertainty is really handled 30 minutes ahead with their 30 minute reserve. So they have a very cheap 30 minute reserve that manages the, the uncertainty. They looked at the cost of that over a period of a year, and they came up with a sum over a billion dollars a year for the value of the energy produced by wind and something like. Uh, $15 million for the cost of the managing the variability and uncertainty. So something like a half a dollar a megawatt hour. That was a, a real revelation when they kind of pulled the numbers apart that way and started thinking about them that way. That's causing a lot of people to rethink uh, the way they do the, the calculation of what the impact of variability and uncertainty is on the system. I want to say just a word about curtailment because forecasting has been very helpful in managing curtailments on the system also. We don't have consistent curtailment data across the whole U.S., but we have a couple of uh, specific regions where DOE in its annual report on the status of wind pulls out curtailment. You can see the biggest curtailment that's uh, shown on this chart here is about 17 percent in ERCOT in 2009 when they had some very serious transmission constraints before they undertook a major build-out in the transmission system. At the end of 2013, they expect that number to be down around 2 percent because of the completion of the transmission system. and then lower levels of curtailment than other regions. I mentioned MISO with the Dispatchable Intermittent Resource Program that was started sometime in the uh, late 2012. Some units were grandfathered so they wouldn't have to go on dispatch, ones that really didn't have the uh, technical capability to do that. But everybody else had to be on dispatch by the end of, uh, end of, 20, end of 2012. And you can see the manual curtailment in red versus the DIR curtailment in green. And the finding from ISO has been that with wind on dispatch, 
There's been less curtailment of the wind plant. The wind plant operators have been happier because things are very transparent and very easy to see. And the, uh, the system operator has been very happy also because things are done automatically now. They don't have to be done manually. It's been a good, a good change in operations for both the uh, plant owners and the, and the system operator. A case from Excel, a wind plant on AGC, again going back to Excel that has the, uh, the advanced forecasting system. They've been able to, because of their confidence in the forecast, put a wind plant on AGC and let wind provide the balancing for the system during the, uh, the nighttime operation when they've got all their coal plants bottomed out at their minimum operating point. They wouldn't have been able to do that if they had had the, uh, hadn't had the confidence in the forecast. But I'm running out of time here. I wanted to talk about a NISO curtailment example and a, the dilemma that's been presented because of if you go to a five-minute dispatch and just use the five-minute persistence for the forecast, that you, you ask the question, well, what do I need the wind forecast for? Well, the, uh, let me just flip through here. With the, uh, <clears throat> the New York ISO, with their wind plants on forecast, go back. What, what they find is that they're actually using, they're able to curtail individual wind plants to relieve transmission constraints, but they're actually using the uh, large area uh, day ahead forecast in their unit commitment process so that they really find that they need uh, two, two forecasts. They, they need the persistence forecast to do the curtailment if it's necessary to do the, uh, the economic dispatch, but they still need the day ahead forecast to do the unit commitment day ahead. So there's really a blending of the two forecasts, and I think that's been an important finding uh, for them, and also a, a, some comfort that the, uh, there's value in the long-term forecast and also value in the five-minute persistence forecast with wind on dispatch. So in conclusion, we haven't found any real fundamental technical barriers to the integration of large amounts of variable generation on the system, but it's not gonna be done under a business-as-usual scenario. There needs to be continuing evolution in three areas, transmission planning, system operation policy, and market development for this to happen. And I wanted to close with just a, a saying from Texas that I heard when I was down there uh, last year that I thought was kind of neat. If all you ever do is all you ever done, then all you ever get is all you ever got. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we're a little bit behind, but we have time for one or two quick questions. Are there any takers? Maybe everyone's just desperate for coffee. Charlie, that was really interesting, and it was nice to see the quantification of the value of the forecast. Most of the examples were for wind energy. Um, you know, we're starting to develop more solar now. As we develop solar further, what do you think are going to be the value areas? What's going to be different with wind, you know, with the more rapid variability, more difficulty in, in uh, predicting ramps, those sorts of things? Uh, I think that the, um, I would say we're probably about where we were uh, in the solar area with wind about five years ago, that really the solar forecasting is just starting to come come into, uh, into being, you know, we're getting a little, little bit of understanding for it. You certainly realize that there's uh, more variability and uncertainty associated with the solar, but when you start aggregating it over broad areas, you get uh, much smoother output. I think that the forecast for solar will probably be uh, more important than for wind as the, solar, as the solar picks up. The ramps already we see in the morning and the night uh, are very, very large when the sun comes up and when the sun goes down. Some of that can be mitigated just by putting ramp controls in the up direction and uh, probably starting to take off solar before the uh, sun goes down so that ramps down in a smoother fashion. But I, I think that the forecasting will probably be as or more important for solar as it is for wind, and I, it's a little early to uh, provide any quantitative numbers on that yet. I think we just don't have them. Thank you. I'm afraid we're probably about out of time for questions. Um, so it might have to be the coffee break now, I'm afraid. But so it just remains to say thank you again to, well, to Charles and to all the in interesting, um, very interesting talks this morning. And before